and welcome back to Why This Film, the podcast where we rewatch a movie from your childhood and have a chat about it. I'm Emily Slade and welcome back. You watched it so many times before and now you're gonna watch it again. But it's been so many years since you last saw it and now you show it to your friends and they're like, what? What am I watching? Why? What? Why? Why Why this this film? film? And this week I'm joined again by David. Hello, David. Hello, I am the stranger from the internet. <laughs> the <stranger>. Returned. <laughs> Returned. Volume two, stranger from the internet, volume two. Um, and we're doing it's. It's like it's funny how this movie came about. Mm-hmm. So when I first asked you what you wanted to do, you came up with Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, which yeah. we did last yeah. season. And you said, if I recall, you were like, there is a random movie that I vaguely remember that when I rewatched it, I thought it was shit. Yeah. Um, and I initially, before I knew he wasn't a murderer, was like, <laughs> I'm not letting you do this movie because this is my favourite movie of all time. If you're going to die, you're not going to die <laughs> having some guy having slate your favourite movie. Literally. So we're doing Dragonheart, 1996, directed by Rob Cohen. The IMDb breakdown is the last dragon and a dis- disillusioned dragon slaying knight must cooperate to stop an evil king who was just given partial immortality. <laughs> I'd say that's fairly accurate as a uh, synopsis go. Yeah, I, I can't really argue with that. This movie is Oscar nominated. Really? Mm-hmm. For special effects? Yes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Wouldn't be for the acting. Hey! Oh, we're going to fall out, aren't oh, we? We're gonna... <laughs> this will be the last episode that David is ever on. <laughs> I I mean, what's your relationship with this movie? So, so when I was a kid, Dragonheart was one of those films that was always on TV. Yes. It's kind of like, and I don't really have much of a memory of watching it from start to finish. Mm-hmm. I kind of have memories of jumping in partway through or jumping in at the beginning and then having to go do something else. But it was always on. So I definitely saw it fully over the course of several years. But I do remember it as as a kid. And I remember it was, you know, it's a giant dragon and knights and sword fights and stuff like that. And then uh, I was on holiday with my family when I was, I don't know, early teens or something. And it was on DVD. And I was like, oh, I remember this as a kid and enjoying it then. So I bought it on DVD. And I watched it quite a lot back then. I really enjoyed it, um, I think. Partly because it's a dragon being voiced by Sean Connery. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of his work. And yeah, I, I enjoyed it when I was younger. And then I found out that there was a sequel starring uh, one of the guys from Malcolm in the Middle. Which I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. Because Dragon High is supposed to be the last, the last one. Mm-hmm. And then I found out that there was a third and fourth Dragonheart film. Yes. But the third film is a prequel and the fourth film is a prequel, is a sequel to the prequel. Which comes out this year. I thought it was already out. Mm, so there's Dragonheart. Yeah. Dragonheart 2, A New Beginning. Yeah. Dragonheart 3, The Sorcerer's Curse. Which is set before the first one. Dragonheart Battle for Heartfire, which yeah. must be the one that you're talking yeah. about. And then coming out this year is Dragonheart Vengeance. There's a fifth one. There's a fifth one. Okay. I have to say, I've only seen the first and second. Same here. Um, I am up for watching the others, though. <laughs> No. <laughs> I'm going to... I've I'll, seen... I'll do, I'll do it. I'll do it on my own time. <laughs> <laughs> we, so basically, that was when I watched this again recently. It was for my friend Louise's birthday. And our friendship group, we tend to have like... Sometimes we have like bad movie days or where we just, you know, get to a living room. Oh, the looks I'm getting right now saying bad movie days. Hear me out, hear me out. Okay. But one of the ideas was we would marathon all four Dragonheart films nice. in release order. And I was thinking in my head, the first Dragonheart is really great. I'm sure the second one is probably really shit. Spoiler alert, it is. And then we saw the first one again. And as I was watching it, I was like, oh, this isn't as great as I remember it. And that's still kind of my opinion now after watching it again yesterday. (laughs) Anyway, good night, everybody. (laughs) And that was David. Um, I have the same backstory, basically. It was always on Channel 5 alongside, like, The Goonies and Nevering Story. They would have, like, a movie on at 5pm every Sunday. And um, this was on a lot. And I remember the first time we ever watched it, we caught it on TV. 
and we had made our own pizzas that night. I just remember that for some reason. Right. And we watched Dragon Heart, and I was like, "This is because that that would happen a lot. Like the same thing happened with Legend and the Neverending Story. I would catch it on TV, and I would mm-hmm. be like, my life has changed. Yeah. I am now that that is my religion, and I need mm-hmm. it. So I would go to HMV and I would buy it on DVD. Yeah. And I watched it. Every single day for about seven years. I adored it. I still cite it as my favourite movie of all time. Like, I... Okay. I love it. And it's 100% the nostalgia and the rose-tintedness that overpowers my logic when re-watching it. Because I do watch it now and there's, there is like a five-minute segment of the movie that I, I'll admit, even this time around I went and made a cup of tea over because I was like, I can not see that and it will be fine. Over um, five minutes? Yes! <laughs> Because what I will say about this movie is I, it's, it's like the old westerns where everything was very clean and simple. It's like that. It's an Arthurian tale that's very, like, no one's really very dirty. Everyone can, like, read and write. And, like, it just, it's just very simple and quite black and white. But it's, Mm -hmm. but it's also different. Like, they specifically chose David Thewlis for the villain because they wanted someone that would be brain over brawn. And they um, have uh, a really excellent female character who doesn't end up with the guy at the end. Um, True. Just all these things that were quite, just slightly different from all the other movies that were coming out at the time. And the CGI, some of it doesn't, but a lot of it does still hold up to this day. More so than like Gollum in 2001. Um, I won't go that far. Well, 2001, not 2002. I'm talking about. Oh, like, what were well, you didn't see Gollum? Gollum. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, some of the CGI is like, oh no, but some of the CGI is. For 1996, yeah. they, that's where the budget went. Mm. But saying that, it's also got an exceptional cast. And this cast do do a good job of taking this dialogue that can sometimes be very goofy and childish. (laughs) Hey, so it's like (laughs) The Last Unicorn where some of the lines are like, you've got your tongue-in-cheek humour, then you've got your, like, absolute goofiness. Like, one of the opening lines is, the peasants are revolting. They've always been revolting, my lord, but now they're rebelling. It's like Monty Python jokes. But then you've also got, like, um, God, was it dreams die hard and you hold them in your hands long after they've turned to dust? Like, things like that. Do you know what I mean? And they're just like, and I think that's the problem with this movie and why people don't get on board with it, because it has a tonal problem. Absolutely, yes. I love a bad tonal problem. Okay. <laughs> Black Cauldron, Hunchback of Notre Dame, like, all of these movies that, like, it's almost like there were two people involved and one wanted to go that way and one wanted to go that way and they just decided to do both things. Yeah. And it sort of feels like that happened in this movie a little bit. But I, it's so deeply embedded in my consciousness now that I just blanket forgive it. And I'm just like, I'll pretend that just didn't happen. I kind of agree with the two different people wanting to go different ways because watching it again recently it felt like kind not so much two different films but one film that they didn't have enough of a runtime to make Mm -hmm. it feels like a film which is about a disgraced knight who rebels against his king and is then persuaded to help the peasants you know rise up and fight him and you know take over and whatnot and then it's almost if the filmmakers went we need to add something else how about a dragon (laughs) And so, especially towards the end, it kind of feels like the whole dragon thing is kind of sidelined a little bit for the peasants revolting and stuff. I, and I know what you're saying, but fundamentally, the, the primary villain, which is David Thewlis... He looks like a snake. Oh, I, I forgot how... I loved him. I will admit, he's clearly having a whale of a time. Oh, they all are. This is the thing. It's these exceptional actors that are just grounding this weird off-kilter movie in some sort of reality and they're playing it serious enough while still having a good time that you just you buy it whereas I think any other cast Mm. it wouldn't have worked so well so you've got David Thewlis as the villain Dennis Quaid as Bowen who is the main knight of the old code who becomes a dragon slayer now let's get on to him (laughs) let's get on to Dennis Quaid shall we because in the 90s another film that came out a classic British film called Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I did think, yeah. And Robin Hood <laughs> is played... Now, Robin Hood, the epitome of an English character, yeah. is played by Kevin Costner, 
takes on the role of Robin of Loxley. Doesn't even attempt a British accent. He attempts like a couple of times. He attempts at the start. And no, then, not at the start. Tonight I shall dine with my father in Nottingham. I don't think he barely, I don't think he really attempts at all, to be <laughs> honest. You've got, so everyone rips into Kevin Costner for that. Mm-hmm. Dennis Quaid is not even attempting a British accent in this. He is full on American. You know what? That's never... When I thought of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, I thought Mm. this is trying to recreate Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, like, for children, almost. Like, this is trying to have that vibe. Kind of, yeah. I never clocked that the entire cast, except the main female and male, were British, and that they're American. Like, it, I never... It never threw me off guard. I was never like, oh, American accents. I just accepted it. I was just like, yep, that's the hero, and that's the woman, and then everyone else is like, wonderful British actors. Like, that's that. That's how movies work. I accepted it as a kid, but listening to it more recently, it gets more jarring each time, and I'm like, Fair. why are you... He keeps talking about being a knight of the old code, and King Arthur, and this is like... But you're just... Talking like you're, you've got an American way. accent. Like, <laughs> why like, did no one say, Dennis? Do you want to, <laughs> do you want to give it a go? <laughs> maybe. I and then oh, yeah. the the oh, who's the woman? Dina Meyer. She plays Kara. Oh, I just wrote in my notes the ginger girl, the ginger yank. <laughs> <laughs> she is brilliant. Let me just check that I got her name right. Yeah, Dina Meyer. Dina Meyer plays Kara. Yeah, again, she's just full on American, but her dad isn't. Yeah, her dad is like a renowned... Terry O'Neill is her dad. Oh, really? Yeah. Is he the one that gets blinded? Yeah. And then he just gets shot. Yeah. Yeah. Again, there's just <laughs> a load of, like... Like, yeah. Julie Christie's in this film. I forget Julie every time Christie, until I watch yeah. it. I'm like, oh, yeah, Julie Christie's in this film. And Doing an excellent job, making me cry with everything she says. Why is she in there? She deserves better than this. Apparently David Thewlis's agent put her up for it, which is bizarre because you would have thought that Julie Christie's agent would have put David Thewlis up for it, but apparently not. Um, she's she's brilliant. She brings such a gravitas and a... You believe it and you side with it. Because she's... she. So Bowen is a knight of the old code and, and she's King Island's mother, the queen, mm. who hates her husband. And... Um, she's the one that basically brings a dying young King Island to Sean Connery Dragon. And he takes half of his heart and puts it in the young king. And therefore they share a bond and it makes the king immortal. For oh, you said that so blasé. <laughs> <laughs> Just watching it recently, I was like, why is that your go-to? <laughs> The go-to is like, he's been stabbed to the dragon cave. <laughs> the dragon. We'll just take his half his heart. He'll be fine with it. But that's a movie, man. Well, yeah, I guess. That is a, we wouldn't have a movie otherwise. Exactly. And so she's um, she's got a wonderful name. What's her name? Oh, I don't know. Her name is... It's Queen something or other. Yeah, so it's some brilliant name. And it's like Daughter of the Celts, yeah. she's called. And she like worships the dragons and she calls him my lord. And they clearly have this rapport because they have this whole thing about like, are the stars shining brightly tonight? And she's like, no, my lord. I would admit for the little prologue at the beginning, you got to give shout out to, and I only know this because I'm looking at the IMDb page right now, shout out to Lee Oakes, who plays the young King Ainan. Yes. Because I... I Remember him as a kid, and it's like he is perfect casting to yeah. turn into David Thewlis. David Thewlis, he is just—he's brilliant, he, and he's—he's he's a genuinely good actor as well. Like you, uh, it, I don't know. There was just so much emotion. I find the opening of Dragonheart is well paced and it's exciting, and there's intrigue. Mm. That like it's—it's. It's, I really. Whatever else happens after that, I think the beginning and the end of Dragonheart, especially are excellent like i really do yeah the one thing that i'm not too keen on is like they kind of show pretty much straight away that you know the young king is a bit of a dickhead Mm. and you know all of this and then dennis quaid just full-on sees full well that his kid's a dickhead and a little bit sadistic and probably borderline psychopath and yet he then blames the dragon because i think him and julie christie um think that the dragon heart will uh, overwhelm whatever good is inside the boy and it will take over and they will teach him the ways of the old ways and the ways of the dragon and the ways of the knights and everything will be fine mm. and then 
they try and stop it very early on and that's what leads to the plot essentially because Bowen is like what the fuck Einan you said you would be brilliant and do you all literally the next good. scene the you've next gone scene. against it you bastard um, and so he flees and he, he does blame the dragon because he doesn't know about the dragons he would think that like oh this ancient reptilian monster has cursed this child that I put all of my hopes in yeah. so he goes and kills every dragon until he finds the last one Sean Connery doesn't click that he's the one with that like... an iconic voice as well come <laughs> on man <laughs> Sean Connery is famously the voice of Draco the dragon and they did take all of his facial expressions in like a computer thing and like you you can see that it's Sean Connery as the dragon I yeah. think um, which is brilliant you've got Jason Isaacs as Ainan's like right hand man um, that surprised me seeing it recently I was like Fuck, it's Jason it's Isaacs. Jason Isaac. That's so bizarre. Again, doing like just a really like pre Lucius Malfoy, like like this was almost his audition for Lucius Malfoy. Yeah. Um, it's brilliant. And then you've got Pete fucking Possilwaith as uh, a wandering monk. It's brilliant. He's I just perfect. I've seen his full name on going to be Gilbert of Brockenspur. Yep. I just know him as Brother Gilbert. He's obviously <laughs> one of these actors who is clearly just in it for the fun of it and mm. is having a whale of a time doing it. But also, again, bringing. A comedy, but also a a real sort of reality and grounding to these. Ca- like he he shoots some guy. Like there's this running joke that he's like, even though he's like a monk and religious or whatever, mm. he's a very good warrior and he's yeah. excellent with a bow and arrow. And he shoots someone in the butt and he's like, oh, turn the other cheek, brother. And it, but he he gets away <laughs> with it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I get, because it's Pete Bosway. The thing is, I would like this film more if it just stuck to the silliness. But sometimes I feel like no, you I go... No, I think I would. Because it's so silly. <laughs> but it, it balances the silly with the serious, I think. And that is why I like it. If it was all goofy and silly, I yeah. don't think I would have enjoyed it. Even as a child, I wouldn't have enjoyed it. I do think some of the... There are some quite good serious moments, but sometimes I don't think they're that well. Um, and... Especially, like, there's the bit at the end, which I was... Oh, we're jumping all over the place with the plot here. But the bit at the end with the... To the stars. Right. That bit. Right. As a kid, and I was younger, that would always get me. Yeah. And as an adult, the music makes me feel emotional. Yeah. For definite. But I just think, like... I don't... It doesn't... It, to me, it just didn't feel... Uh, it felt like they'd sidelined the dragon a bit. And I was like, you've got a fucking giant dragon. Use him a little bit more. But he was captured by the dragon slayers. I know, those dragon slayers are fucking useless in my eyes. <laughs> Get rid of them. Sure. I thought it would be not. I thought you could have had a bit more, maybe a, more of a dialogue scene with the king and the dragon. You don't really get That's a good point. too much of it. I feel like if you had that, if you had that moment of them trying to talk about it and then, you know, you could see the point. And also, I don't feel like there's that much prejudice against dragons so much and that... You know, the Queen's first port of call, as soon as her son's been stabbed in the... Well, he's been knocked into and like a clumsy idiot, he just lands on a spike. It's like, oh, fuck. First port of call, son's heart's been penetrated. He survives for a very long time. Very long time. Is go to the dragon, dragon gets sorted. So I got the impression that dragons were kind of seen in a good light. And then later in the film, it's like, ah, we're just fucking killing them all. I feel like... I feel and like everyone hates them. Of, I feel like it's a sort of... Um almost ancient England place where like one religion exists alongside another religion so the old religion was clearly about the dragons and the Celts yeah. and then the new the, the barbarian king who'd married the what was clearly like the princess of the Celts or something has brought in a new wave of not believing in the old code not believing in the dragons and that's what was going forward so people would just forget about the dragons or not care or not worship them as much or whatever and then and then Bowen makes it his like life's work to go and kill them all anyway um and i think dragons it seems like it's a world where and this is from me watching it over years of time that i've imagined this universe that it's set in i can't yeah you're right on like a one-off viewing perhaps you would be like what the fuck but um and it seems like the dragons are fine and they tend to keep them to themselves but obviously if a huge dragon came over your farmlands, you would be like, oh shit, a dragon, and it might steal your cattle and sheep, or whatever. Um, I feel like you've put more depth into this <laughs> than the filmmakers did. Because I didn't get any of that no, from the film. I think, I, think that is, I think it is there. I think it is there. Um, the biggest 
biggest thing about this movie, and it is the biggest thing, and you briefly touched on it just a second ago, is the soundtrack. Primarily the track to the stars. The one at which... the end. I only know it's called that because I have it on Spotify and it's, you know, that's the line he says, to the stars. To the stars to the and it is, stars. it is a beautiful piece of music. It is, and it's, you will that's have heard right. it from every single trailer that has ever been released. Yeah. Ever. It is always played over trailers. It used to be played in my local cinema. Nice. Yes, yes yeah. yeah. Um, it was used for the Oscars 1997 and the 2004 Olympics in the US. Oh, wow, really? But, like, it is a popular piece of music you will have heard the piece of music um and it is gorgeous and when you combine it with all of these dialogue the like you hear at the beginning as well just the soundtrack is great like it is Mm. so great um i do think the soundtrack is probably the best bit of it and i think mm. if that soundtrack did not exist and it was just a generic fantasy soundtrack that I probably wouldn't have even given this film a second thought today. I think that music stuck with me so much as a kid. Yeah. I actually remember that more. I remember that soundtrack on the same level that I remember the Jurassic Park theme. Yeah. Or the Star Wars soundtrack or mm-hmm. something like that. But I just looking back at the film, it doesn't feel like the film is up to the same standard as the music is. Music. I feel like the music really brought it up. Especially. I know what you're saying. And I think I think it wanted to be a much grander blockbustery movie than it ended up being. And for yeah. that, I love it. That's why I love it. Because it does have this... They really tried to make something big here and they ended up making something still very, very good and enjoyable, mm. but not as big as they wanted. And I really appreciate it for that and that's why I love it. Um... We're never going to get another movie like it because now any Arthurian movies are covered in blood and mud and you're just like... Oh, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, fucking King Arthur. And you're like, stop swearing. Have you seen the guy Richard King Arthur? No, is that? I know that that's what it is. It'll be like, oh, all right, I'm fucking King Arthur. It's, yeah, pretty much. Pretty, <laughs> and there's some giant elephants in it as well. For fuck's sake. That's a very weird film. And there's a bit in the sound... David Beckham's in that film. What? He's there, like, when Arthur's about to pull the sword out of the stone and... He just says to this guard who's guarding the sword, he's like, oh, where do, where do I go? Uh, or where do you want me? And David Beckham's like, bouncing on my knee. Where do you think? Hands on the hilt, stupid. I was like, where the fuck's David Beckham in this film? Yeah. Have you just had an aneurysm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call an ambulance, please. That sounds ghastly. You I watch know. it. Get drunk. Mm-mm. Get drunk Mm-mm. and watch it. Mm-mm. You have to be drunk to watch Mm-mm. it. No. You've flat out refused. <laughs> I refuse. I'm not going to waste my time. Because it will be like three hours long and it'll, everyone will be covered in mud and they'll try and do something with the editing where it's like super fast and like mud flying up into the camera. And then like everyone will be swearing and be like, ho, ho, ho. there'll be like one woman in it if we're lucky. Um, are we even have that you seen lucky? It? No, I think you've seen the film. No, I have not seen the film. I just know movies. So, I saw the there must trailer be a woman. There must be a woman and that there. was enough. Yeah, there'll be a there'll be a woman that's re- referred to as Maid Marian, like at the end of the movie, and then like in the in the uh, Maid Marian assumption that she that's be... the Robin Hood film. Oh, have you seen that one it. as well? No, <laughs> but it's again, Edgerton. it's the same fucking Russell Crowe guy. Like they're all the same. They're all the same. Mud and blood and swearing. <laughs> Give me Sean Connery as a dragon, and everyone's tidy and neat with nice hair. I think we should say, you know. He is the standout in this film, Sean Connery. This yeah. was in the 90s when Sean Connery was pretty much... He won an award everywhere. for this movie. He won a voiceover award. He does do. He does do a good job. His voice is top tier. Mm. And for the most part, you know, it, the dragon is a good design and it does look good. There are a few times the CGI doesn't work. And then there's yeah. one point where you've got Dennis Quaid stuck in a model of the dragon's mouth. Yes. And you've got, like, the real puppet with the CGI over it that doesn't quite blend. And, and it's Jim Henson's Creature Shop, so, mm. like, the puppet is good. And, like, yeah. they do clever things where they thought, oh, he's a reptile, so he'll, like, unhinge his jaw like a snake in yeah. order to eat. So then Bowie gets stuck in the mouth, and you can see the tongue moving, and it's... Again, I That's like That's a grim that. scene where he's yeah. just sitting on his tongue, <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's so, it's so gross. I do think it's really cool. The Jim Henson's Creature Shop had made the model for the dragon, mm. and they did a good job. And you're right, the CGI gets a bit iffy, I think, where um, <laughs> they, go, they first go to Sean Connery Dragon to get his heart, and she's like, I promise he'll do good. And Dennis Quaid's like, what the fuck is going on? 
And then Sean Connery goes, witness the wonders of an ancient glory. And then it like cuts to some really... It cuts to him like guy. ripping open his chest. And it, it, reminded, me of, it reminded me of the 1998 Godzilla film. Nice. Because the CGI in that does not hold up mm-hmm. one bit. And it's that weird like PC graphics. Yeah. And there's a few times in the film where that does happen. It just looks odd. And there's a bit like where... You know, so Bowen and um, Sean Connery, <laughs> he has a name, but it's Draco. Bertie, Draco, where they, you know, come up with this deal very quickly, I think. With someone yeah, with such a heavy yeah. prejudice against it's, dragons, he's like, all right, like, fuck it. Draco was like just waiting for a knight to come along to be like, mm, I really want to make some money. I've got a money making mm. scheme, just got to wait for the right person. Because they're very quick to be like, let's team up, pretend yeah. to kill you, and collect a reward. That's what they do. I think it would have been interesting. And maybe added a bit more depth to it if, you know, Byrne went along with it because he doesn't want to get eaten. Mm-hmm. But he went along with it. But in the back of his head, always wanting to kill Draco. And then the, he learns throughout the course of the film, actually, he's not such a bad guy. And they, they do keep that, that going. He, that is the, that, they, the best friend. He's so best quick best to become friend. his best friend, though. I because, find that so Because they rushed. have that conversation around the fire where he's like, stop calling me dragon and he's like well what's your name and he's like you can't pronounce it and then he's like Ugh. and then he gets injured so yeah. then Bowen helps his wounds and then he's like I've thought of a name for you and he calls him Draco and then boom best friends it just seems so it felt so rushed I felt like but we could like, have had more the movie would be a lot longer I felt like it could have been a bit longer. Maybe no. cut out some of the stuff with the peasants. I don't it's care about them. No, get rid I of Dina Meyer. I'm not a fan of no! her either. She's the best bit of the nah, movie. Nah, get rid of her. She's brilliant. Let's talk about Dina Meyer. Dina Meyer plays Kara, who is the reason that King Einan gets injured as a boy. She accidentally bumps into him and his heart gets pierced. She's got this like massive amount of red hair and that's why he remembers her as an adult. The only ginger in the kingdom. <laughs> the only ginger in the kingdom other than him. Yeah. Um, that's why they're meant to be. Um, she grows up to be Dina Meyer, and Dina Meyer, you may know from Saw, or you may know she's the one that gets her rib cage ripped open, spoiler alert, or she's in Birds of Prey, the original TV series, not the new Marco Robbie movie that's coming out. Uh-huh. I love her. She was chosen because they needed someone that looked like she could actually be a warrior without going Xena. So yeah. she needs, and she does, she handles axes, she handles spears, she's very grounded and down to earth and athletic without being like, she wears like, uh, big baggy like uh, woven like Anglo-Saxon clothing that's like tied up with like these long sleeves like she's never once sexualized. I will admit yeah that is a good point she's never you know they could have easily just put her in these tight fitting corsets yeah. and you know tits out everywhere Tunics. which you know just aim the arrows there to be honest Literally. so yeah she is dressed no, she's always dressed like appropriate to the period and that's the thing about this mm. movie it's not trying to appeal it's just trying to tell an Arthurian story and that's what's really nice about it and she's brilliant she's so capable she's learned she learns she's got spirit she's got hope you never see her and Bowen kiss the vet, the only thing you get is Kara and Bowen led the people through a time of peace and they were known as the golden years mm. um, but you do not assume that they got married or even together they just led the people in a time of peace there is that moment where she's practicing yes. fighting and he kind of goes up behind her and he's like they, yeah, trying to swing it and I was like ghost. I feel like that they put that in for test audience going what do you think and they've just gone oh, because like remember Bowen was there at the rebellion at the beginning of the movie as Dennis Quaid Dina Meyer was there as young Good Dina point, Meyer yeah. actor that doesn't stop so, Hollywood to be honest no it doesn't and in fact they're probably like perfect age gap because <laughs> he's like 40 and she's like 20 but um, they didn't do it, and that was what I... Like, she does see him as a sort of mentor, and you probably yeah. fancy your teachers. That's a normal thing to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee you, you didn't know my teachers. <laughs> Definitely not. But she's she's capable, and she's heroic, and she's brave, and she, like, she she constantly... she never, So Ayn and Abbas basically, like, I wouldn't even say falls in love with her. He just, um, because I used to mistake the line where he's got her kid, she tries, she breaks it, he kills her dad, she breaks into the castle to kill him, he puts her under like house arrest or whatever, he goes down to see her and he's like, oh hey, you're the one that gave me this wound, I owe you one, the next thing you see is they're in the bedroom and she's like, stabbed him, and, doesn't he try and kiss her? Yeah, so, so he yeah, tries to kiss her, I'm but she weird. immediately pushes him off. Find that weird. She like it it's is like, weird. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, 
you stabbed my heart, DTF. But that's but, the thing, ugh. that's ugh. the thing, because I used to think, she goes, I'll pierce your heart. And he's like, you already did. And I used to take that as, ah, not like, not ah, <laughs> but like, you're meant to be like, oh, okay, he's falling in love with her. But actually, he's just factually being like, you did, turns out I'm a mortal You did, bitch. you stabbed me in the heart, love. That's what happened. Wow, and you fell into like... me. It was the most accidental, <laughs> clumsy heart stabbing ever. And, um, and then she's, she, every advance he makes, he's, she's pushing him off, she's stabbing him with the knife. She like, she's really not succumbing to being a damsel at any point. Because he's so she, skinny, he'd just float away. Yeah. <laughs> he then is like, I will give you anything. Like, you're beautiful, you're, you're hot, you're feisty. That's all we ask for here in the 90s. Like, let's <laughs> get married and you can be my queen. I'll give you... Pa-. Like, he doesn't even do it. He's not even like, I, I adore you, you're wonderful, I'll give you everything. He's like, I can same. give you power if you power. agree to stay with me because you're really beautiful. The second she gets an opportunity to escape that castle, which is the next scene where Julie Christie comes and re- releases her, she goes, not once is she like, oh, but maybe I can change him, or, oh, but maybe I am not seeing him for it. She's out of there. She's gone back, and she's immediately back down to the peasant village to be like, we should start a rebellion. And everyone's like, fuck the fucking fuck <laughs> off. And she's like, no, this fucking sucks. We need to do something about it. And as a kid, I was just like, fucking yeah. Like all the other women at the time, we were going through nineties feminism. So you got your Mulans and you got your uh, Kayleys from your Quest for Camelots. But there was something about Kara that it wasn't just a lip service mm. to being strong. She just was strong and brave and flawed. And that's what I loved about her. She I was annoying. With a, with a lot of like in quotes strong female characters uh, that men write, they are they forget that all characters should have flaws and yeah. weaknesses. They are like the badass, kick-ass girls mm-hmm. who are dressed sexy because they want to be. Yeah. We want to wear leotards, mm-hmm. men. We do and they're ourselves. just kicking ass so easily. I hate it. You've got it. like, make them unlikable. That's what I... They're even doing it today. Um, in It, the one girl in the Losers Club is like the perfect human. Like, she can do no wrong. She She's ginger as well. Wrong. Maybe that's what Hollywood's trying to say. Yeah. Is that, you know, gingers are the way gingers forward. Gingers are the way forward. My Lego people always used to be ginger. I used to want to be ginger. <laughs> Possibly because of this movie. There you Probably go. because of this movie. Anyway, I love Carl. I wanted to be a dragon because of this movie. <laughs> She's brilliant. She genuinely is an excellent example of a female character, especially especially in a fantasy, especially in a pre Game of Thrones fantasy. Yeah, I'll give you that. I'm not overly keen on her performance. I did find but... it a bit. You didn't too... like her line delivery. You knew my mother! You knew my father! It's just, uh, the American accent actually really grates on, (laughs) not normally, but in this film, when it's so British, and you've got, like, some of the crop of British acting, like Judy Christie in here, and Sean Connery, obviously, is Sean Connery, and then you've got this really whining American voice that really grates on me, and there must be so many good British actors that could have done uh, the part of... Kara. Kara. I don't even know. I actually keep looking at her name. I can't remember it. That makes me seem so bad. Um, I just think that could have. I, that's the only thing, really. But now I think about it, yeah, yeah. on paper, it does seem like a good character. Mm-hmm. I personally don't think that was very well conveyed on screen by the performance. But hey. I like the bit where she got a melon smushed in her face. That was funny. I remember that as a kid. I don't know why. <laughs> And, um, of course, the, you, it cannot be a 90s movie with a strong female protagonist without the line, A girl! I got killed by a girl! And even as a child, I was like, stop. <laughs> Just stop. Like, um, no, we didn't, no. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. That's yeah, what I that... to say about that. And, and, and the one girl in the film. I mean, how rare could that be? There's only there's so many men that could have killed me. There was Why this two, one girl? Yeah, there's two women in this movie. God, that's such a good point. There are two named women in this movie, and one of them dies. They both die. Oh no, yeah, <laughs> I, I Cara thought Cara died. Die. No, yeah. Judy Christie. Judy Christie. Dies. How does she die again? Oh, she tries to kill the dragon, and then David Thewlis is like, "Ah, oh, fuck you, mum." Which is a really I think it's a really brilliant scene because they're they're playing alongside the CGI dragon and she comes down because she knows what she needs to do and it's so sad because Sean Connery is playing it with such heart and he's like, are the stars shining tonight? And she's like, brightly, my lord. 
brightly. Why does she hire the dragon slayers? So they can kill the dragon. Ah, oh, yes, They just happen to be shit at their she's job. she's wanting to kill her son. She wants to kill her son. That was it. Because we can't it. kill Iron without fe- killing was, Draco. That was a bit I fell asleep in when I watched it again last night. I swear to God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I tried. I really tried. <laughs> But I was tired. <laughs> I was just like, oh, rest my eyes for a bit. Oh, fuck, what's happened? <laughs> oh, it's, they're just fighting still. It's brilliant. It's genuinely one of my favourite moments where... Um, she, and then she goes to kill him and then uh, David Thewlis comes up behind her and he's like, ugh. And he's like, that's why you got me the dragon slayers. You want me dead. And she went, I want to undo a mistake I made years ago saving someone that was not worth saving. And he's like, how unmotherly. You really should have figured that out. I was a dick son beforehand. <laughs> no person. half of a dragon heart's going to change that. I literally wrecked the crown out of my dead, my dying <laughs> dad's hand going, it's mine, it's mine. How no are you was all... there to see that. Oh, I'm sure a peasant must have seen it. How are you all anyway. surprised? But, um... And then it's brilliant because then the dragon's like really changed to the floor and he's like, grr, mm. grr, grr. And Julie Christie walks off probably knowing she's about to get killed. David Thewlis just does this brilliant acting without saying anything where he like looks to the dragon and then he like looks after Julie Christie and then he just slowly goes after her and they both disappear through this black doorway and you just hear this like, Whoosh, ah! and you're like, oh, all right, P. Julie Christie. I don't know why we needed that scream. I know. <laughs> it was so corny. The I mean, bit you, have like such a... A, you have such a serious scene and then it just goes really corny with the... Ah! And I, I like, really, really watched it this time because he's holding this long spear and just as you don't even see the end of the, di- end of the spear disappear fully into the blackness before you hear the like whooshing noise as if he's mm. like pushed it forward into the back or something. So you know... That like nothing even happened. There's just sound effects that you're hearing. Either that, or she just didn't move that far. Away <laughs> yeah, the door. And he just like, or she uh, stopped. She walked in like, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, wow, fuck, that was easy. <laughs> sort of that problem out, um, which is a shame, but it also cements him as a true villain, and it uh, means that she can no longer help anyone. Um, you're right, there's a lot going on in this movie in that you've got King Island storyline, King Island storyline with his mother, King Island storyline with Kara, then you've mm. got David Thewlis, that's King Island, shut up, you've got <laughs> Bowen with Sean Connery, and then you've got Bowen with Kara, and then you've got Bowen with the peasants, and then you've got Kara with Bowen, and Kara with Sean Connery, and Kara with, and then you've got Pete Possible with him, that, that, there's a lot of different things going on. I feel like the movie started with this, like, you have the prologue, which is the whole thing with the dragon and the mystery behind that, and then... Once that finishes, you've then got the whole peasant upright, peasant revolting, peasant uprising, you know, the King's Street and Badly, blah, blah, blah. Then that film stops, and then we cut back to the dragon and the buddy cop dragon yeah. movie <laughs> with Dennis funny. Quaid and Draco. And then after we've had a load of stuff with that, then King Island just randomly horse rides into the plot. Him and Bowen have a fight, and then we're back to the film about the peasants uprising. But there also just happens to be a dragon in there until there's not. Yeah. And it's like, pick one or the other, or make the film longer and make it a bit more... Fleshed out. I a guess. bit more fleshed out. And I think that's what I found frustrating. I was like, I'd like a silly buddy cop movie with a dragon and Bowen, or a serious movie about Peasants Uprising. But it's just, the films are really fighting to decide which one we want to do. And also, I think more people should be... A, they, they take on this dragon quite willy-nilly and part of their army. No one's really that amazed. They're like... Oh, cool, yeah, this is a dragon in the middle of the village. This is a fucking dragon, guys. And it's talking. Is that just... Yeah, it's the, the fact that the dragon is talking is what's so widely accepted. Because I doubt any other sort of animal... But maybe they are just like, oh, well, it's a dragon. Dragons obviously talk the human speech, like, mm. as well as their With own thick speech. Scottish accents as well. <laughs> there are a few bits, like... Obviously, they've animated it to Sean Connery's face and Ooh. performance. And there are a few bits where... You know, it looks amazing and they've done a good job blending that face and animation. And there's a few times, which I found hilarious, where the dragon just starts doing hand movements similar to a human. Oh. Like at one point, he's like, you know, going like this through his neck, like, oh, stop talking. Yeah. There's one bit where it looks like he could have, he should no, have a no. collar, where he's like, oh, oh God, that's <laughs> awkward. I feel like, should he have a collar there? He's just like, oh. Like, and it just looks really weird. Oh, um, um, yeah, I... And you I, agree. I agree. That's why you're creasing. When he's just doing human movements with his arms, it's like that just really, looks so stupid. Really bizarre. There's like brilliant moments of the dragon that looks 
he comes out of a lake of water at one point and he's like wet and the animation the cgi is just brilliant and he sees a flock of sheep and he's like very sean connery uh, does he want to fuck like, those sheep no, he's he just like them. He's no, like, the way he says oh, it he goes hello hello i was like he wants to fuck those <laughs> no, sheep no he wants to weird. eat the sheep obviously he wants to eat the sheep he's and, not a welsh um, dragon <laughs> Well, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> I don't even my, know who we're with, but my girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> oh, I won't tell her to listen to this one. <laughs> I'm in so one. much trouble. <laughs> Edit that out. Edit that out. Um, no, that's staying in. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that bit's a brilliant, still holds up piece of CGI animation, mm-hmm. use of Sean Connery, really excellent piece. <sighs> And it, Hello. it's the bit where, like, Bowen's like, he's like, you must have really hated us. And it feels like it's going to be a really serious scene around the fire. And Bowen's like, I hated one of you. He corrupted a young boy's heart, and now I hunt the rest because I could never find him. If you're the last, he must have died long ago, and I'll never get my revenge. And then Draco's like, ah, oh, the heart didn't poison iron, and oh, the boy poisoned the heart. And he's like, how do you know that? How do you know that, dragon? And then he like Ooh, scratches no. the back of his head. He's like, "Oh, dragons know that story." And you're like, "Stop!" It really takes away from quite doing a serious moment. So well, and then you're like, "I thought." Oh, I don't know. You May as well have just shrugged. <laughs> it, it, or it could have been serious again. It could have been like. All dragons know that story because we know it's Sean Connery. <laughs> we like we're not under any pretense. We know it's yeah. Sean Connery dragon. Um, but yeah, I agree with that. That's um, it's a it's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame. Um, so the they go to Avalon, which is the, obviously as we all know the resting place of King Arthur. <sighs> Why? Because. King Arthur movie. Where the fuck's the ghost of King Arthur come I from? I didn't. I thought Avalon was like the Garden of Eden, in that it like wasn't actually a place. I don't know. Um, I don't. It just seems really random. So they fly over, and he's and like, "I is born to Valor." <laughs> so cheesy. It's brilliant. You hold your tongue. So they go to Avalon, and it's pissing it down with rain. And everyone's like, we've all given up hope. We'll never have a rebellion. We'll never be able to king up, kill Ainan. What are we going to do? And Bowen's like, oh, I've given up all hope of being an old knight. Like, I used to stick so harshly to the code, and now I don't give a shit. And everyone sort of leaves him and fucks off. And then John Gielgud, as King Arthur, yeah. <laughs> appears through, like, a what? stone. This, oh, and he's this like, cast. a knight just sworn to valor. And David, uh, Dennis Quaid is like, a knight is sworn to valor. It's like a knight is sworn to valor, <laughs> valor. Oh, and they like do a thing, and it's raining, and he's yelling at John Gielgud, and John Gielgud's yelling back, and then Draco appears, and he's all like, "Are you ready to be okay again?" Draco now? is like, "Who the fuck are you yelling at, you <laughs> weirdo? There's no one there." All right, I'll cover you with my wing. Which and I they have a hug. Like. They have a hug. They have a hug, and it's brilliant because <laughs> they're best of friends. I did love the friendships that are built in this movie. There's there's real like brotherly love and like friendship mm. and um, camaraderie and like companionship rather than just like heterosexual marriage and shit. Like yeah. the only married couple in the movie hate each other and the husband dies at the beginning. It's brilliant. He comes into the queen <laughs> and this dude is like, Your Majesty, the king is dead. And she literally doesn't even give it the time of day. She cool, just like whatever. essentially shrugs and looks back down again. And he's like, uh, oh. <laughs> and then they bring an Ooh, oh. <laughs> um, But I like that bit. It's good. <laughs> you shut up. <laughs> um, so this they... is a really good debate about this film. <laughs> I like it. Well, I don't. You shut your mouth. <laughs> you, your opinion doesn't count. <laughs> um, so I've put this movie makes me cry. And then I've put an asterisk next to every single time it makes me cry. When he names him Draco, I cry. Mm. Uh, when he says, dreams die hard, and you hold them in your hand long after they have turned to dust, I cry. Mm. Um, when it's the trailer shot, you know the shot where he's like, oh, the drag- the you and who is army? And he like rides to the sunset, and then the dragon comes up behind the hill. You'll have seen the one. I cry. Um, that does look good. Are the stars shining tonight? Brightly, my lord. Brightly. I cry. And then like, it's you that has to do it. Conversation. I cry, and then the end. I I like the weep at the end. I do like the bit where you know the heart's beating, and you're David Thewlis doing that run, and then Slow I am just 
throws the axe and Draco. And I thought that was a nice. There's sound in that where it just goes all quiet and you just yeah. hear. <laughs> That was pretty good. It's a clever little choice. So obviously Drake... And then he just to... flips iron and over and it looks really silly. <laughs> and I was like, why? No. You just had iron because it just fell over and he says he just goes, whoop, and flips him over on his back and he's just there like, uh, uh. I was like, no, we don't, we know what's happened. We don't need to see him do a fucking four roll. Just let's see Sean because Connery. He's coming for him. So it's really clever how they do it. He's not going to do anything. He's dead now. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. I promise you it's good. It's very clever. He like... They have this conversation where Draco's like, you have to do it, Bowen, as my friend. Please. And he's like, I, I can't, I can't kill you. You can't ask me to do this. And Sean Connery's like, you must, you must. And we don't know where Iron is. And then he's like, he's coming, he's he's coming. And everyone's like, oh, fuck. And it's really tense. And he like does that cool thing from the trailer as well where he does the two lines of fire between Bowen. Mm. And he's like, no. And he throws the axe down and he's like, pick it up. And then Einan appears and he's like, do it, you have to do it. And then you're right, the music cuts out and you just hear a heartbeat. So they don't even really get a goodbye because they're having this conversation and then Bowen just has to kill him. Yeah. And he dies and then he, basically Einan's coming towards him with a knife. So he self-defenses himself. And yes, that involves him doing a flip or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but then what? he, <laughs> he flattens onto the ground and then it's a brilliant death scene where it's the heart is still going and it just like stops basically yeah. as as David Thewlis does a good like death face um, and then like the peasants run in completely silently which is very respectful of them very good of <laughs> they them they charge too. in without even knowing what's really going on but and they like burst through the doors but they just they're not speaking like, yeah. <laughs> which is really good because they're like oh it's just dead body yeah um and then Draco... Haven't caused many of those dead bodies. Like, <laughs> yeah. Fuck, a dead body. Oh, another dead body. Um, oh, shit, there's a dragon in this film. <laughs> Where the fuck did he come from? <laughs> and, but then he disappears and he turns into the stars and he's like... He's one with the force. Where, where shall we... What should we do now, Draco? Where should we turn to? The stars, Bowen. To the stars. And Good thing he asked that question. Plays. He said, what should we do now? Uh, to the start no, didn't work. <laughs> ask something else Bowen uh, where should we go mm, no not that question ask me something else um, um, what should we look for no get it right it's brilliant and then he goes up and he joins the stars which has been like planted throughout the movie there's a constellation of stars that look like a dragon and only like the hero dragons get to reside there in the afterlife and mm. he gets to be the eye and it winks yeah it does doesn't it because this is the film from the 90s so of course it has to fucking wink because you've just got that it's quite sappy but it's good and then it winks it's like ah, oh, it's too much it's just it's undermines much. it's just why it's do you need to where it just goes that little bit too far also so they've just overthrown the king mm. there goes the fucking law and royalty in that kingdom but in the epilogue it's like it was all fine I was like, I don't think yeah. it would be. I think the peasants would be, you know, falling over themselves to take charge no. of the chaos. Bowen and Kara lead the peasants into a time of peace. How? Draco looks over them and it's brilliant. Fun fact, guess who they wanted to play Bowen? I've heard of a few names. I've heard Liam Neeson was a top choice. Liam Neeson which... was cast and then the studio went... We don't believe Liam Neeson is an action hero. Fuck me. <laughs> well, I loved... I know Pierce Brosnan was another choice. Yeah. Um, a lot of, you know, actors that can do accents suitable to the <laughs> time period and location of this film. We're not chosen. Um, um, Robert I, Williams was considered, but he wanted to do the voice of the dragon instead. And they were like... No. Can you imagine... A whole different movie. Robin Williams, the voice of the... The animators would be like, fuck me, we've got <laughs> so much material to use. <laughs> it would have been that a whole different movie. That would have been a different movie, yeah. Cause... What I find quite nice is that in this one you've got Sean Connery in a... I don't know which one attributes to which movie, but obviously we've talked about all of the different... Random, like, this franchise has gone on, like... There, so this was 96, then Dragonheart 2 was 2000, no, 2015, 2017, 2020, like, Why did they bring it's it back? still going. Yeah. I, I don't know, there must be something about it. The name, I, at I believe they are all straight to DVD films. Yes, they are. Um, Dragonheart 2, A New <laughs> Beginning, is hot garbage. It's, it's so, so bad. It's so bad. My favourite line, where we all watched it as a, in our friend group, and the favourite bit was the king, who fuck knows what drugs he was on. <laughs> But there's just a bit where these guys come in and the king just goes, oh, is it my birthday? No. And that's all I remember about that film. That's all, 
um, me, my girlfriend, and my friends know about that film is the bit where the king goes, "Is it my birthday?" And that's it. Don't remember anything with um, Francis from Malcolm in the Middle. Yeah. Don't remember anything about the dragon. No, he was an egg. I think he was Draco's son. I don't fucking I know. know. And then you've got these other films which are prequels. I don't know about the 2021 that's Same coming out this year. Hopefully the fifth was- one. The fifth, the fifth Dragonheart. Fifth Dragonheart movie. Fuck but me. But they brought in people like Sir Ben Kingsley voices the dragon in one. Patrick Stewart voices the dragon in another. Jesus they still Christ. managed to secure these like Sean Connery esque voices for yeah. the dragon. So clearly they're doing something right. They've got a tax bill. That if needs they paying came to me and wanted fucking me to do the voice of the dragon in a Dragonheart movie, I wouldn't turn them around. Maybe in Dragonheart Eleven or yeah. something. <laughs> yeah, Dragonheart Fifteen. When they've run out of two old dragon, white British movies. actors. Be like, oh, we better get some. Let's, let's, let's get, get a, a woman, woman dragon. <laughs> Helen Mirren's busy. Oh, fuck. What about Maggie Smith? Let's try her. I actually, I'd watch it if Maggie Smith was. Yes, a I'd dragon. watch a Maggie Smith dragon movie. But hands she, down. But it's unscripted. It's just Maggie Smith it's riffing. Just riffing. <laughs> just going. Oh, I hate this. Um, the only other thing I really have to say is that I adore the sword fight by the waterfall. Like I really do like that fight between Bowen and Ainen. Um, Too much scream. I didn't like the fact he's just like screaming. You were the chosen one. You were the chosen one. (laughs) It does. It's so much screaming from Dennis Quaid, and I was like, I get that there's a waterfall, but it's like it all seems like on one level you go straight up to, and that's it for the whole fight. And I'm like, oh god, because he's emotional because he was his hope and now they're reflecting the sword fight they had at the beginning when they were in training and the dragon jumps out of the waterfall and flashes david through this and he's like oh fuck and they run off obviously david it's been... like scared faces are really good all of david thewlis's faces in this are good mm-hmm. let's be honest good in the sense that they're fucking hilarious they're brilliant i love him i love him as i and i love all of them you, know you mentioned good. earlier how cara wasn't seduced by david thewlis because mm. uh, what's his name Einan, that's the one Einan. Einan. He wasn't. She wasn't seduced by him. Wanted to change him because look at him. It's that wig mixed with that face. No offense to David Thewlis. I he's one of my favorite actors. David. He plays my favorite character in the Harry Potter series. He's got such an iconic voice. Mm-hmm. But it's just he looks like a snake in a wig, and, and it's great. He he does. He looks awful, and I think they would cop out of that these days if they remade this. As well. They would cast, like they did in the new King Arthur movies, they would cast like Jude Law oh, yeah. as the villain. They, they cast someone, someone in their 40s, but who was known as, who as quite attractive. a hot... Like Orlando Bloom yeah. was the villain in The Three Musketeers. Like, Fuck me. Have you seen like, that film? No, because Ooh. I don't watch bad movies on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. There were just some I times... I torture myself and waste my money. But there were just some times where you know the movie's going to be bad. And you're just, but it's you're... not going to be so bad, it's good. It's just going to be bad. Yeah, but sometimes you just have to see, no. see it to believe it. No. We, I, I, maybe it's just the people <laughs> I hang out with, but me like, and my friends, we'll wrong. go out and watch bad movies. I love bad movies, like proper bad movies, like The Room. Oh. Like, sorry, yeah. Yeah, The, yeah, room. the, that's, room. Yeah, the room. Not The, <laughs> the Brie room. Larson Room, The Tommy yeah. Wiseau Room. Tommy Wiseau yeah. Room. Um, I love that. I love, I love like, really shittily budget I love all the like shitty Stephen King adaptations I love I love like genuinely bad movies like Love Never Dies like I love when it's so bad it's good yeah. those adaptations of law by all of these like oh, blah, 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 directors where they just cover the, even the King Arthur with Keira Knightley I was like no oh, I don't like it which one's that one Oh fuck! That's the one with Clive Owen, isn't it? Yeah, where like, oh, yeah. like he's like found in a cave with broken fingers or something. That's all I remember from that movie. Terrible movie, but um, from the director of A Knight's Tale, which is brilliant. Hmm. Uh, yeah, this is an unpopular opinion. I'm not the biggest fan of A Knight's Tale. Why not? I just don't know. It's never clicked with me. Maybe I need to watch it again, and maybe I think it's actually good, but. Yeah, I know. I'm not even looking at you now because I know your eyes are like daggers at the moment. Mm-hmm. This is an unpopular opinion and it Very caused a lot of rifts at uni as well. <laughs> Did you lose many friends? Yeah, I lost many friends. <laughs> and, uh, I like Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger's a great actor. I like the cast. I like Paul Bettany and Alan Tudjik and they're all great. But just, yeah, just never really connected with me the same way it did other people and I was like everyone, everyone else in the universe you know? every, every, sure why not and I just I don't get the hype for A Knight's Tale <sighs> maybe that would be the third time <laughs> I come on this podcast if you would dare let me back on after this 
<laughs> it's an unpopular opinion, I know. Yeah. Maybe I need to watch it again. I mean, I, I do. I've seen a lot of Heath Ledger's films, and I think he's one of the best actors we've had who died far, far, far too young. Um, so maybe I should give A Knight's Tale more of a chance. And if, maybe I'll love it. Maybe, maybe I'll hate it even more. Maybe I'll be banished from the world. Yeah, I think if you hate it too much, they do kick you off the planet, so be careful. Just that film? Just that film. Oh, can I redeem myself by liking another film? No. Oh, it's okay. All it's right, all I'm about fine. our movie. Well, fuck it, I'm going out in style. <laughs> Whee! Um, the last thing I have to say is when they have that bit that I'm not a fan of, necessarily... He's, it's like the second time he goes to a village to try and dupe them into killing a dragon and getting their money. Um, it's the clan where, when Draco falls into the lake, the lake's not big enough. Ah, it looks to, so silly. It looks to ridiculous. fall down. But they're like, I can't. Mute. It's not deep enough. And um, it's a bit goofy. And, yeah, and then there's that they... brilliant line from the trailer where Pete Possaway is like, brilliant, Bowen. That one's almost bigger than the last. And he goes... Actually, it's about the same size. It's funny. There are some funny moments it's in there. Really, there are some genuinely funny lines in this movie. Um, but then the clan are all like, meet, meet, meet. And then the dragon obviously flies away because he doesn't want to get eaten. So then they turn to the trio, Harry, Ron and Hermione. And they're like, oh, <laughs> meet, meet, meet. It is, it is Harry, Ron and Hermione. Um, and like, yeah, I didn't uh, the they're surrounded by pigs. <laughs> like surrounded by pigs. You can't get cheese from a pig. You can't really get milk from a pig. <laughs> what else do you do with a pig other than cook and eat it? So why Ask do David we, Cameron. Why do we need to... Ooh, ooh, oh, political oh. banter. Um, the state of the country is in pieces. Uh, <laughs> what? Um, what? Why do you suddenly turn to cannibalism when you're literally having to push a pig out of your way to get to the person that you're then trying to... That was the one part of the... That was the only part of this movie that, that I was like... Only part of the movie. Okay. <laughs> don't quite buy that one. And That's... I bought it as a kid, but this time around I was like, mm, you've got pigs. Cannibalism is just a weak joke to fill this padding before we start the How do we move on to the next scene? Uh, you know, the village would be pissed off anyway because that dragon's clear, not dead. But, ah, uh, fuck it, they want to eat him. I don't know. Yeah, it was like first draft idea and they just kept it in kind of thing. Um, mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yay. Well, I, so yeah. did you, was it recently, is it a bit, yes, so was it recently that you came to the opinion that you were like this, oh no, it was, so would you, were you expecting to have your mind changed back with nostalgia when you rewatched it this time around? Um... I wasn't sure. Um, I remember when I watched it, it must have been about a year or maybe a year or two ago, and I watched it again uh, for the first time in a very long time with friends and suddenly coming to the realisation that oh, this film is not as good as I remember it. And I did, may, well, maybe watching it again last night, I thought maybe I'll just, because it would just be me and my my girlfriend's there, it's not really paying that much attention to the film, so maybe I can just put myself back in that phone when mine's a kid, but... I couldn't really. I just found it a bit naff. That's probably the best way I'd describe it. How I describe it, just my personal opinion. Please don't kill me. <laughs> and I just think the, your wrong opinion. the emotional, <laughs> the emotional impact the film gave me when I was younger, it wasn't there, and I felt wasn't warranted at certain parts of the film. Okay. In my opinion. Okay. It'd be interesting if it. I don't, it'd be interesting. This film feels like that. I'm amazed that filmmakers haven't remade this film today. Yeah, well, they keep bringing out enough sequels that you're right. Why hasn't it just undergone the reboot effect? Yeah. But I don't think. You could make a franchise out of this, like a cinematic franchise, easily. Easily, but I don't think the the title Dragonheart is clearly now associated with straight to DVD. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. So I don't think anyone would chance it in a in a cinema. Also, I wouldn't trust them because what. What's nice about this and what they could get away with in the 90s, because we're talking like, sorry, life, but like we're talking like a pre-9-11 world where everything was like just that little bit more still okay. And so mm. this is not saying anything other than your classic good versus evil, hope and bravery will out, hurrah. You can't have movies like that anymore. There's you just no... don't without any 
anything it needs yeah. it will need to say something or reflect something especially using the fantasy genre mm. that's the best way to parallel narratives these days so you would have to decide what you would do with it and i can't think off the top of my head anything really that you could do with it because it is just such a simple tale of bravery and hope mm. and that's why i love it and why it is so nostalgic to me and why when i watch it i am just like I returned to like 1999 when I first watched it or whatever yeah. and I'm just like this is brilliant I just everyone should just be brave and resilient and <laughs> lovely rather than like ah oh, yes of course they're trying to say this about that and blah blah it's blah it's not a blah, metaphor blah, blah, blah. for anything no, about the state it's of a story and you don't really get movies like that anymore a romp yeah, it's Probably just the best a, way to put it. Yeah. Like like the Prince of Thieves, like like a lot of movies that were coming out in the nineties that were just mm. like fun like romps and they they do try and go back to Arthurian legend and Robin Hood legend. Yeah. Um I don't know if they succeed. They keep making them, but it's always those sort of gritty as we were saying, like that gritty vibe, and I don't know if they try and say anything with those movies or again if they're just like oh, come and watch this movie because it's this actor slicing up these actors and there's lots of mud. Pretty much, yeah. They, I don't. I, there's a video that this guy on YouTube called Patrick Willems has done where he's talked about how there hasn't been a good Robin Hood or King Arthur film in a very long time, yet Hollywood just continues to make them because uh, the rights have reverted back to the public, so you can just churn them out yeah. and they are... All the same film. The last, the King, last King Arthur film, and last Robin Hood film are essentially the same film, yeah. and not good. Yeah. I don't know why, because you've got because all the ingredients not, for a great film. Because but... they're trying to use, they'll be trying to use the Game of Thrones hype. Yeah. With their aesthetic, mm -hmm. but they don't have the weight and grounding in political, historical intrigue and drama that Game mm. of Thrones has. So they'll be flat. Yeah. They're not trying to say anything with them, but they're, we're no longer in a world where we can just accept a fun movie for the sake of it mm. that's grounded in a medieval setting, I don't think, because we have nothing to relate to other than, like, if you're a LARPer. Is that the term? If you LARP, if you're a LARPer. I believe that's the term, yes. But do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think it appeals to the masses in a way like a pre-9-11 world did. I feel like those kind of medieval type, you know, swords and sorcery films, I feel like they've... What's happened to them is similar to what happened to Westerns. Westerns had their heyday. Filmmakers continue to try and bring them back. And it, unless your name is Quentin Tarantino, <laughs> rarely works mm -hmm. and it never has that resurgence. And I think those kind of you know, fantasy movies. And to an extent, some of the TV shows, if they're not a 15 or 18 certificate, if they don't have swearing tits. and tits and dragons mm -hmm. and everything like that, I don't think they work. Like The Witcher on Netflix, it's really difficult not to compare it to Game of Thrones because it's a fantasy mm -hmm. which has tits and swearing and other stuff in it. I don't want to spoil it in case anyone hasn't seen it. <laughs> It's an interesting show. Henry Cavill's good, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I am looking forward to seeing it. But as a big fan of the 80s sword and sorcery genre... You do not get those films these days at all. And you can't. And they try and make them grittier, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But and you I can't guess make this... them softer, because no one will watch them. No, that's true. And obviously people will try... If this film came out today... Um, I mean, I've got to give it credit. As much as I'm not a fan of it anymore, as I was as a kid, I do think it's too goofy it's too meh it's just it doesn't have that emotional weight as it did before as uh, unlike some blockbusters in the 90s do like i could watch jurassic park it, it would still be amazing yeah. i would never even if someone said to me you know the cgi there doesn't look that way shut up yeah, yeah. dinosaurs are real fuck off <laughs> films like that uh, even to an extent robin hood prince of thieves i love it i feel like this was trying it's to like capture something that, like really. that but it's just so Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is just so... I don't know how... It's on a different scale. You can't describe it. Whereas this, it's like... It is quite a basic story. There is a dragon in it. And that's kind of like the... But if you took away the dragon, it would it would just yeah. be the most bog-standard film... Fantasy Fantasy film, film out there. Well, not even a fantasy film. Just well, a bog-standard King Arthur-esque type legend yeah. film. Peasants Uprising and stuff like that. Which it's we've true. seen in Robin Hood. 
and so it would just be seen as a like, maybe that was it maybe this was that was what the film was originally and the filmmakers were like oh fuck it's a bit too much like Robin Hood dragons get Sean Connery back <laughs> yeah. he was in every of the all of those King Arthur films yeah he's in Robin Hood Prince of Thieves there's that film he's, he's in, in First Night yeah what was that film he's in Richard Gere or is that First Night I think that's First Night oh it's First Night it's literally there yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's another film where he's King Arthur he's, like, he's, in, all, he's in all of them mm-hmm. he's just King Arthur half the time then he's Richard yeah. then he's this and that but yeah, he's good at playing old kings. But yeah, it's um, it's I think it's a it's a shame, but it's also like at least they're not trying to recreate them mm. in that way. And like if they were, perhaps television is the place to do it. Yeah. Uh, maybe it needs to be aimed at children. Maybe it needs to have a different structure or format where it's like based in a contemporary setting and we go back in time somehow or something like maybe that's the only way it's going to work but even then it's there is there's that film. it's called Black Knight with Martin Lawrence and it's not good oh, oh no <laughs> but it's one of those films you're like why the fuck has this been made but alright let's do it <laughs> there's another film where well it's not a film it's like a a TV series which has kind of been bunched into a film which again I watched with the friends I mentioned earlier I uh, can't remember what it's called, but Whoopi Goldberg goes back in time to, like, medieval times. Uh-huh. And she's all modern and 90s and... Yes, it rings a bell. It's... I don't know what it is, though. Me neither. And I've lots wa- of them at that And point. I've watched it and it's <laughs> fucking weird. Some kind yeah. of weird time machine and it's just Whoopi Goldberg being Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, fair. But yeah, those kind of fantasy films, like Dragonheart, like Robin Hood, and this is they this don't gotta, exist anymore. This has got to be on its way out. This is 1996, yeah. And when you think that, like, um, uh, my God, this film was out a long time ago. Yeah, makes me feel old. I'm so old. And uh, oh, I just looked at the laptop and it said 2020, and I hadn't seen it written down. <laughs> oh shit, we're in 2020. 2020. Yeah. Gross. I remember the millennium. Um, do you remember when 10 years ago was the 90s? Yes, I do. <laughs> what happened, isn't that? Um, 10 years ago was the 80s. Uh, <laughs> come on now. Um, they don't... Yeah, they... What was I saying? They... Um, this was 1996, and yeah. all of the main sword and sorcery movies were coming out in the 80s, like Excalibur, First yeah. Night, that Merlin adaptation with Sam Neill, um, oh, all yeah. of the good ones. And then this must have been one of the last ditch attempts at this setting and genre, because until Lord of the Rings reinvents fantasy in 2001 mm. it, it dies for four years yeah. and I think that's I mean I don't know how well this movie did probably not particularly well but I mean look action adventure fantasy you don't see those three things anymore I want to find out actually what it's box office was because as a kid I m- knew about everyone knew about this film mm. so that makes me think that it must have done quite well at least to warrant a sequel is that worldwide that one? It's... 115.3 million which is probably good for the 90s it, yeah. a budget of 17 million fuck me these days every blockbuster is made for 200 million pretty yeah. much yeah. and that was only made for 17 okay I will take back any criticism on CGI for that much of, of a small budget mm. fair play to them 50% on Rotten Tomatoes so it's kind of split critics a bit I imagine so, because you can't deny that the budget is there and the acting is there and the sort of narrative is there. And then it, it just depends on your taste then as to whether you enjoy the goofy humour or whether you think that, like... Because that would have been at the time as well when this CGI was probably groundbreaking. Mm, yeah. Until, again, another five years in 2002 with Gollum. Oh, yeah. Like, that was the that was a new standard for, mm. for fantasy films. I think as well... I think we did have an attempt to bring back a kind of, you know, kid-friendly... Because Lord of the Rings was... Well, amazingly, the first film was, like, PG, which I don't understand now. There was decapitation in that. Um, But obviously that was, you know, taking fantasy a lot more seriously Mm -hmm. and not trying to hide it with this goofy humour and stuff like that. But you had... uh, I can't remember to pronounce it. Aragon? That was with the dragon. Yeah. That was kind of an attempt to be a new Lord of the Rings and also reinvent this, you know... Lord of the Rings did resurrect the fantasy fantasy, yeah. But yeah, there was... Because then you had the adaptation... At the same time you were having Harry Potter, which arguably could be called fantasy, you were having... Yeah. um, 
then Harry Potter led to Percy Jackson being made and things like that. Yeah, it was that YA fantasy yeah, with that, Harry Potter. Um, and with Twilight as well, which could arguably call, be called fantasy. That's died out now, hasn't it? The whole YA thing. It doesn't really seem to be um, around much anymore. Yeah, I... Or is that something that's gone to Netflix too? Possibly. I feel like if you're not a Disney film, you're on Netflix probably. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Here's a fun fact. Dragonheart was nominated at the Oscars for Best Visual Effects and it was up against Independence Day and Twister. Independence Day obviously won. Twister, I just remember fucking cows flying around the air yeah. and that looked terrible as a kid and it's not nominated for best visual effects the standard that low oh god the, the 90s man good job dragon heart yeah no uh, i i will take that why i said i think the cgi for the time definitely although it doesn't all hold up now i think it's the performance of sean connery that helps it hold up really to be honest i knew it i knew it I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. When the Cats trailer, Cats 2019, when the Cats trailer hit... Where the fuck is this going? The tagline at the very end was, you will believe. And I did a whole rant on Twitter where I thought that used to be the tagline for the Prince of Egypt because I knew it was a tagline from my childhood. Mm. It wasn't the Prince of Egypt. It's what's on the Dragonheart poster, you will believe. Cats 2019 stole their tagline from Dragonheart 1996. That's all I've got to say about that. I think there's a lot to be said about (laughs) Cats, to be honest. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it yet, but I want to. Uh, no. I'm flat out <laughs> refusing. Um, a lot of my know? friends want me to see it because uh-huh. I put my... I was going to do like a film blog, but in the end, that's just changed to writing Facebook status about films. And a lot of people have commented on some of the ones I've done or messaged me and gone, can you go see Cats? <laughs> we want to hear what you have to say about that. And yeah. I'm like, no, yeah. I don't want to fucking see Cats. <laughs> Fuck me, this podcast is about cats now. I've not seen it, but why the <laughs> fuck did they make that film? What's with the CGI? I, I feel dirty watching the I trailer. Can't wait. I can't why is Idris Elba look naked? It. It's it's sick I and wrong. Download it. I'm so excited to see it. Sick and wrong. The whole yeah. thing. It's sick and wrong. And the CGI okay. wasn't even finished. There's a shot with Judy Dench of her human oh, hand. Wedding ring. Ridiculous. <laughs> she couldn't so. even be fucked to take her wedding ring off. Oh, yeah. oh no. Right, yeah, so Dragon Do you have Heart. anything else to say about Dragon Heart? Um, I, w- I wish I loved it as much as I did when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, you, do, you did love it as a kid. I did love it as a kid. And the music will always be amazing. Yes. I think Sean Connery's great. I kind of wish I'd seen it with someone like Pierce Brosnan or Liam. Actually, Pierce Brosnan. I'd have liked him to have been in it instead of Dennis Quaid. Don't get me wrong, I like Dennis Quaid. But, I don't know. The accent doesn't do it for me. I know what you mean. I did like it as a kid. It's just, I feel like I've grown up and become a bitter, cynical adult. <laughs> and um, it just doesn't have the same effect at all, really. It's too goofy in places. And then the attempt at being serious doesn't really work in conjunction with that. And I feel that. It's <laughs> just it's just kind of, I don't hate it. It's not the worst film in the world. Mm. But, but I don't love it as much. So it's just kind of, it's meh. I think yeah, it's the best so, way to describe it. It's probably just meh. Yeah, yeah, four or five out of ten. I don't know. <laughs> I just said that to get a reaction. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of middle of the line. I don't hate it. I don't love it. It's fine. It's okay. not hurting anyone. I Everything about it. I'm looking at the poster right now. The, the font... The, the poster. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I love it. Look, look it's all like Kelty. It's all like celtic yeah, someone went on Word and just went, yeah. oh, let's just use Celtic <laughs> font. And um, it's like, it's like, it's like coming home. Like it's <laughs> because it's tonally all over the place, because it's goofy as well as serious, because it has these gorgeous lines. It's a brilliant movie to just stick in the background and watch over and over again. It doesn't demand your attention. It no. doesn't... Um, and that's what I love in my movies. I love those those Sunday night movies that you can stick on and it's like having a fireplace roaring in the background. It's just cosy and fun and mm-hmm. you can tune in when they say something serious and sweet and you can go away when he's being dragged through the trees by Sean Connery, which is probably my least favourite scene. <laughs> um, and I was wondering if I would have had a change of heart watching it, a change of dragon heart. Hey, maybe. very good. <laughs> watching it. Um, here in 2020, oh. but um, I still, it's, it, I just, I, I know it doesn't deserve truly to be heralded as anyone's favourite movie, but 
it is still my favourite movie, just to spite people because, <laughs> you know, fuck you. I love this movie. Fair. The script writer, a man by the name of Charles Edward Pogue, also wrote the script for Psycho 3. Mm. Oh, he did write the script for The Fly. Is that a Jeff yeah, Goldblum one? Yeah, The Fly, yeah, 1986. Okay, that's pretty fun. Yeah, it's a Jeff Goldblum one. Um, yeah, I wish I liked it. I just don't, I kind of don't. Maybe that's my childhood disappearing. Oh, no. <laughs> You're growing but up. But then there were some films I loved as a child that I still love now and I'll defend to the ends of the yeah. earth. Like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I know full well that's a terrible movie, but I absolutely love it. It's one of those movies that are so bad, but I don't care. I love it anyway. Yeah. Even to, an ex- one... even to an extent, that Godzilla film. It's it... absolutely dreadful. I had to watch that for this podcast. Did you? Oh, yeah. I, I, remember, the ex- I remember listening to the episode because I was like, oh, yeah, I remember Godzilla. I still kind of like it. Even... A lot of fish. There's so much bad stuff in it. Then you got Jean Renault doing an Elvis impression. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I don't want to revisit that movie. <laughs> um, I get it. I tend not to tell people to watch it because I just know that they'll shit on it. So I'll just... Dragon Heart is my little <laughs> secret yeah. that I keep to myself and I love. Yeah, I, I can had... understand your feelings towards it. And there's a part of me that wishes I had those as well. But mm-hmm. it's, and it might have yeah. had something to do with that brilliant female character as well that I was like, oh, wow, this is what women can be in movies. Possibly, yeah. And yeah. someone to relate to, definitely. And, like, how the villain was, like, brain not brawn and, like, he was he was clever and slimy and, like... Yeah. Whatever. Um, have you got anything to plug? Have I got anything to plug? Um... What am I doing these days? Am I a jobless actor at the moment? You're, you've just recorded for another podcast. Oh yeah, I was on the. I was on the <laughs> well, speaking of being a jobless actor, <laughs> I talked about being a jobless actor on the Irrelevant Actor podcast, <laughs> uh, which was a lot of fun to do. It was whining about stuff, but it was in a good way. In a, it wasn't just whinging yeah. for that long. It was actually a lot of fun. Um, it's a really good support podcast for actors. I, think. I genuinely felt like I came out of a therapy session <laughs> for actors, and I was like, "This is amazing." I felt it was very cathartic as well. Mm. I thought that was brilliant. Um, I have written a play, which I'm in the process of producing at the moment with my girlfriend Hannah Harrison and our friend Chris Hawley, who's an award-winning director. Nice. Uh, producing is hard; it's very time-consuming, which is very difficult when you're also trying to do your quote-unquote real job. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're trying to get that sorted and get yeah so hopefully that all goes well it'll be an interesting play uh it's called aop hitler and it's uh yeah i get that reaction a lot it's a satire um where we have a look at the true story of what happened to hitler at the end of world war Two, where him and the lads uh goebbels going and himmler they escaped World War Two. They didn't actually die. They escaped World War Two um, and escaped Germany at the end of the war. And they go into hiding in the north of England and have to adopt Yorkshire accents, flat caps, whippets and Wellington boots. Amazing. And they plan the epic comeback of the Third Reich down the pub. Excellent. Well, it was an idea we came up with during a rehearsal for Bouncers. And we're just like, uh, just it was because... Someone told me that Hitler visited the north of England once. And I was like, oh, where did he visit? And it was Liverpool. And we all said, oh, if only it had been Yorkshire, then people would have been going, oh, hey, old Hitler. <laughs> and then I said, what a great title for a play. And then I was made to write it. Sounds a, like a 70s sitcom. Kind of, yeah. But it has a lot of offensive stuff in it. And it's also, considering uh, the political state of the country and indeed the world at the moment, <laughs> uh, we do take a look at that. And we wonder if perhaps Hitler might have been comfortable in the world as it is today, Especially. given the rise of the far right mm. and stuff in the mm. UK and Trump. Um. Anyway, go watch Dragon Heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to escape from the harsh reality of the time that you're living in, return to 1996, where everything was, like, kind of okay. Because I was, like, nine, so I didn't know any better. I was five. I might even have been... No, I, yeah, I can't have been nine. I was born in 91. So you didn't five as well. <laughs> this is why we're actors. Math isn't our strong <laughs> strong suit, to be honest. Um, uh, you can find Why This Film on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. You can email into us at whythisfilmpodcast.gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook at Why This Film Podcast. Dragonheart is and always will be my favourite movie of all time. 
you are blessed to have been allowed to come here and give your opinion. And as I leave the flat today, Emily's going to just <laughs> fall out the window backwards, knock into me, <laughs> and is going to impale my heart on a spike. But don't worry, my mum is friends with an ancient dragon, <laughs> dragon. voiced by a famous Scottish actor. <laughs> and I'm sure, Everything. here's hoping he doesn't listen to this podcast, <laughs> and he'll be willing to give me half of his heart. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on Why This Film. Bye! Bye. We watched the film and we talked about it, but now it's time to say goodbye. We'll be back again with another movie that makes you wanna ask why.